All right, welcome everybody. We've got a lot of folks joining us today. So we're gonna give everybody a few minutes to get logged in, but welcome to, um, to Urban Green Lab and Zero Waste National Story of Plastic Community Panel Discussion. My name is Jen Harmon. I'm with the Zero Waste Nashville team with Metro Water Services. Uh, and we're gonna get started here in just a second. So everybody get comfortable, get your lunch, uh, get ready to learn uh, from some wonderful experts here about the story of plastic. And we'll give everybody just another minute to get logged in. All right, so we're going to give everyone just another couple minutes to get some folks logged in. But while we do that, I'll go over uh, just a couple of quick things for everyone. Um, so this is the story of plastic community panel discussion. We're going to have about 45 minutes of discussion from our experts that will be introduced here in just a moment. Uh, my name is Jen Harmon, and I will be hanging out in the chat for you. So if you have questions, we are gonna have time at the end to ask our panel experts some of your questions as well. So if you do have questions as we go along, uh, use that chat feature. It's a little bubble chat at the bottom of your Zoom uh, controls. Click that chat button and then you can ask your questions there. We'll collect those and try to get to as many of them as we can at the end. Uh, so do put those questions there. And I know we've got a lot to get through today. So we are two minutes in and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So again, my name is Jen Harmon. I'm with the Zero Waste Nashville team here with Metro Water Services. And I am uh, excited to be part of our story of plastic community panel discussion that is hosted by Urban Green Lab. We appreciate their help and um, push of this uh, program to learn more about plastic pollution and its impact on our environment and our community. And so today I am going to turn it over to your host Rachel uh, Musetti, she is our zero waste and recycling program coordinator here at, um, with the zero waste team and she has organized this panel for all of you. So I'm gonna turn it over to her, Rachel. Thanks Jen and good afternoon everyone. Welcome, happy America Recycles Day. Um, like Jen said, thanks for joining us in Urban Green Lab for our community panel discussion. Um, we hope you've had the opportunity to view the documentary in advance but if not, don't worry, the link you received when you signed up um, is good for all month. So you can watch it again over your holiday break. You can show it to your family members, your cousins. You can watch it as many times as you would like um, and really get that conversation started. Um, so before we get started with our webinar today, um, like Jen said, um, please do use the chat to ask any questions. Um, we will save time at the end for your community questions. Um, we want you all to be able to interact with our awesome team of experts here. Um, we want to make this as engaging as possible. Um, but your mics have been muted. So instead of raising a hand, please do just drop it in the chat. All right. So today we're lucky enough to be joined by community experts in environmental justice, plastic pollution, and waste. And they're going to help us draw connections between the themes we saw in the film and our own Nashville backyard. So let's go ahead and meet our panelists. Um, our first panelist is Joe Chapman. Joe is the current streams coordinator at the Cumberland River Compact, where he gathers community support for CRC's volunteer events, such as stream cleanups, rain garden maintenance, to pay projects and tree plantings. Um, during undergrad, Joe actually led Take Back the Tap, a campaign to ban plastic bottles on campus. Very exciting. Um, our next panelist is Christina Langone. She serves as a sustainability education manager with Urban Green Lab where she leads sustainable classrooms and students in sustainability programs. She's originally from Massachusetts and she's a proud first-generation college student who understands the importance of education and following your own path towards sustainable living. Our next panelist is Dr. David Paget. He's an associate professor of geography and the director of the Ge Geographic and Information Services Laboratory at Tennessee State University. In 2000, he founded the TSU Geographic Information Sciences Laboratory and has spent over two decades as the lab's director, where he and his many undergraduate research assistants provide technical assistance to geoscience and geographic information systems, or GIS, to environmental justice communities throughout the United States. And finally, we have Sharon Smith joining us today. She's worked in the waste management industry for over 26 years, including 20 years right here at Metro Government um, in our waste services 
So as a special project manager, she oversees all solid waste planning, including the development and implementation of Nashville's long-term zero waste master plan. So we have a great group joining us today. Um, hope you're as excited as I am. And we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. So our first question for all of y'all, and just feel free to kind of, you know, make this as engaging and as pretending we're in person as possible. So go ahead and just popcorn in whenever you have a thought you wanna share. Um, but my first question for y'all is the story of plastic highlights the experiences of many Asian communities struggling to deal with plastic pollution. Were there any connections you made between their experiences and issues that we see here in Nashville locally? Oh, I can I start think with that, that one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Joe. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, that was one of the, the moments in the film that I did see a lot of similarities with a lot of streams around Nashville. Right in the beginning, you see all those bags on the side of the riverbanks. Um, it's not quite that uh, that packed, but there there are a lot of uh, streams like Mill Creek is one that comes to mind, Seven Mile Creek as well. Those two specifically um, have a lot of that, that same feel um, all along, I mean, miles and miles down. It has a lot to do with the development on the, on the river. Um, uh, Old Hickory in Nolensville, there's that Walmart, all those parking lots, road goes right over. And when it rains, you, uh, you know, water, water wants to go to the lowest point and that's always a creek. So everything it picks up, um, including plastic bags and other pollutants, it's going to carry it right into the river. Um, and especially after a flood, um, the river, you know, gets really high. And then when it lowers, all, all that garbage is going to catch on each side. So there's some uh, I think Whit Whits at Park. There's there's trash yeah. that we can't really access, you know, without the ladders. <laughs> well, it should be hard to put ladders in the creek. Um, so, yeah, and, and you know, that's that 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 was definitely a moment that that I saw similarities for sure. Well, and I'd just like to add on to what Joe said because some of the, uh, you know, we had a a flood last year, or I guess it was this year, and you know, a lot of that litter that people dump on the side of the road got washed in. But um, I had the, um, the advantage, I guess, or experience of growing up overseas and um, you know, seeing people sift through trash just to get something valuable to sell. When you look at the, uh, watch the documentary and you see people sorting through um, stuff that has English, that is American branded products. It is particularly disturbing to think that, you know, even here in Nashville, we throw stuff on the side of the road that ends up in the streams. And, uh, and then on the other side, um, stuff that we use gets shipped overseas uh, to other countries where they then have to deal with it. It is uh, probably one of the, the most disturbing things in the documentary to me is watching people and children sifting through uh, garbage that came from countries like ours. Yeah, um, I guess one of the, uh, I guess, I mean, the, the magnitude of the issue is so much greater in those um, Asian countries, it's hard to compare to anything here except, uh, you know, except the difficulty in just the recycling process itself and just how, um, even though at that scale, people were just using their hands and picking stuff out and it was just, looked just horrible. Um, but here, you know, with our, um, I guess, mix, especially with the mixed plastics that we have here, I always wondered about that because I go to the different, I use our recycling center here at Tennessee State University that I helped to establish. And then along with uh, Sharon helped us a lot back then and uh, go out to Green Hills. And I think I took mm -hmm. some stuff out to uh, Bellevue and you look inside the containers and, you know, I've seen television sets. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, and you just wonder like, how does that, what, once that kind of contamination occurs, I mean, in, is is any of that material still recyclable? Are they actually able to pull any of that stuff out that gets in there? Styrofoam in the in the plastics. So yeah, that's the one similarity. It's just the difficulty in separation of plastics. Yeah, 
That is one thing I learned about recycling um, recently that was like made me feel guilty for the years of not knowing that information. Because <laughs> um, I was I was a wish cycler, as you would call it. Like, oh, when oh that, no, I just recycle, you know, but you can't you can't do that because if you even throw a plastic bag in a, in a mix, that'll that'll you know, it'll damage machines. You know, if, if that's what the facility uses, uh, if you throw any any kind of like liquid, it'll it'll contaminate the entire batch so when in doubt throw it out is the rule <laughs> these days i think for me the biggest uh kind of similarity that i saw that i was thinking about for those kind of asian communities that were highlighted in the in the film and then thinking about nashville and surrounding communities is those asian communities weren't you know the elite or the powerful in their in their countries those are folks who are just trying to make a living and to do the best they can for their for their families and I think that you see that in, in Nashville and in, in our communities as well. You know, our largest landfill is in North Nashville, which is a historic black community. And, you know, people are trying to get it to be expanded. And, and the populations there are trying to say, you know, hey, maybe we need to think about this problem a little bit more systemically. Um, and then you have Dixon County, which is 25 miles west of Nashville. And they, you know, in the 90s, the, there, was a, there was a black community that, was being kind of poisoned essentially by the by the landfill getting into their well water. And I believe it was eight years earlier, their white counterparts were warned not to drink the water. And you know, the black community members were asking for this to be um, checked into. And so I think that that it's it's really important to to recognize that, you know, it's horrifying, but it's not surprising. It doesn't matter if you're in Tennessee or if you're in the Philippines or in a Chinese community, you know if we continue to put the problem of pollution and, and environmental destruction on our communities rather than on the companies that are doing the destruction, then we're going to, we're going to see those similar kind of patterns of who's being affected by, by that um, situation. So that's, that was what was going on in my head when I thought that question. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, Christina, is just to focus on the fact that while we may not have, uh, like Dr. David Patchett was saying, we may not have the same struggles you know, we're a lot more privileged, but acknowledging the fact that we can create those struggles here if we keep putting it downstream instead of kind of moving it upstream and holding uh, corporations more responsible. So I think that was a great point. Um, yeah, I saw I guess, a, I, oh, oh, sorry. I saw a, um, oh, it was an article recently on, um, uh, a nonprofit organization in a developing country, and I can't remember where it was, but they were doing audits of, you know, the ocean plastic and things like that that they had found, and you know who the, you know what brand it was, and and of course they're they're all, you know, the I'm not going to say them, but you know the folks that you would imagine they are, and you just think, why don't why doesn't the industry care? Why don't individuals care? Why is it okay? Why is it okay for us to basically dump on the side of the road and then also dump on another country? Yeah, and I think one of the points that I really liked that was brought up with this question was what Joe said was how, you know, he used to be a wish cycler and then he learned and like how his his actions were impacting so many other people who were actually recycling correctly. So I guess going, kind of going off of that, like there were a lot of different facts um, that were presented and the film discussed the timeline of the plastic crisis. So did any of these facts surprise you or were there any that you wish more people were aware of? I, I guess um, one of the things that surprised me was the small percentage of plastics that are well, like correctly recycled that are like, yeah. you know, like 2%. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, that, that was, um, I, I've, I've heard numbers like that before. It's kind of discouraging, you know, but um, it's, um, but then when you're up against uh, big oil, uh, you know, it's, um, I mean, you've, we, we've seen the big oil companies destroy public transit in this country systematically um and it's and then just i don't know you're just listening to some of the interviews 
where people were just, you know, no vision, just let's get this oil, let's make more plastic, let our grandkids deal with the aftermath. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just so matter of fact, like with no consideration of the oncoming destruction. But, but I guess for us, we're kind of buffered from it a little bit. Um, you know, I, I asked my students, um, if they've ever been in a city where in the garbage, when the trash collectors went on strike and most of them said, well, no. And you get a real appreciation after a couple of weeks um, when that trash starts literally piling up and you've got, you know, rats doing valet service in front of your house and roaches doing electric <laughs> slide. <laughs> then you'll pay these, these sanitation workers anything to come get it yeah. but but until people are just faced with it it's it's like almost like out of sight out of mind literally yeah one of the most interesting statistics to me was that i think it was uh half of all the plastic ever produced was produced in the last 15 years which just kind of goes to what dr pageant was saying it's just escalating and nobody seems to realize or care so if if half of it was in the last 15 years and uh, it, it increases exponentially um, in the next five years, potentially, or seven years, we could be doubling again. And, and it's one of those things that like on one hand, you think of, oh, it's just like a plastic bottle or it's a plastic bag, but the sheer volume of that material with really truly no real way to recycle most of it and you just start envisioning all of that piling up and piling up and not even just piling up in the United States, but piling up around the world, it does start to get a little concerning and it does start to explain why do we have so much plastic in the ocean? Why are we drinking plastic? Why are we uh, eating plastic? And that was the other kind of scary thing in there was talking about how much plastic we're actually ingesting. And we don't even know it because it's just like part of what we what we use what we see what we eat what we drink it's everywhere yeah sharon that that was definitely the the first comment that you made about the 15 years um and the half of the plastic kind of coming in those last 15 years you know uh, i'm i'm only 30 and and you know so like i'm i'm used to see uh, you know plastic is just my life you know and i think a lot of folks kind of feel like that they kind of forget that there was even a time before plastic and and i think we need to start thinking about that and, and kind of untangling ourselves from this problem that was sort of thrust upon us and i think that was kind of the most interesting and kind of devastating parts of the of the film was when they were talking about in india those single serving uh, sachets that they were called and you know that was it wasn't a community need it wasn't you know, it wasn't being yeah. drawn because you know we had this huge huge you know need for it and want for it uh, you know there was no it was just we had so much supply and i think that was like that was the biggest thing that i really want folks to take away from from this film is that you know, we have those sachets and you go to the store and your cucumber, which already comes with its own protective skin, you know, is wrapped in cellophane. <laughs> Why? No one wants it. And it's because we have so much plastic that just needs a home. And one of the things that I think the film really pointed out to and, and Dr. Paget alluded to is, is kind of is big oil is the fact that, you know, we have these government subsidies and tax breaks. And they were talking about the 2005 Energy Policy Act in the film. It's basically so cheap to make this plastic that they're just trying to find places to use it. And I think that was really one of the most horrifying things of, of the film is it's, it's not demand, it's, it's being driven by supply, which is lopsided in, in yeah. the community. Yeah, I would say I would, that's what surprised me a lot too, Christina, is when they showed like, oh, this, there was a head and shoulders. So like, oh, this is for America. It's a big bottle, recycled plastic and then the, the tiny little packet single serving um for india i believe and it's like i had i had no idea that they you know when there's not regulation i guess corporations will cut all the corners they can so it is important that we regulate these industries as strictly as we can especially with the harm that they're doing yeah and it's not even so much you know obviously it's it's putting regulations and, and rules in place but it's also just removing the incentives 
to like mm-hmm. keep yeah. using this oil and to keep turning it into plastic, you know, especially as we move away, you know, transition from fossil fuels in our energy source, like we, there, the film basically is like, oh, it's going to go all towards plastic, which goes to Sharon saying, you know, it's going to exponentially increase. And if we're not talking about that, if people don't know that, then it's not even going to change. I think that's, it's, it's horrifying. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of my favorite quotes from the film was that um, when they were in Indonesia, they were talking about how there's no way you can manage this waste because it isn't meant to be managed. Um, I think that's what y'all are alluding to here is that there are just so many, like we have aspirations and like Joe said, like we can recycle what we want. We can hope it gets recycled, but you know, I think it's either Sharon or Dr. Padgett who said like, it's like 2% of 9% that actually gets effectively recycled. Like it's not a large portion. Um, so knowing all that and like kind of having, you know, those internal battles, like the documentary mentioned several roadblocks that activists have hit regarding the plastic problem and their creative solutions around them. Um, in your guys' roles here as community leaders, um, have you had any similar experiences? Are there any solutions that you're especially proud of with your organizations or you personally? I don't know that I could say personally, but um, I'm really excited about what Maine has been doing. And I don't know if anybody's following that, where they passed what's called extended producer responsibility legislation, which means that instead of the producer being responsible for the creation of the product, they're responsible for the cost of the entire life cycle, sort of cradle to, to grave in the case of most plastic. And what they're doing is they're requiring uh, the manufacturers to be responsible for the cost of the recycling or the disposal of the plastic. I think it's going to be very interesting to watch and see how that legislation, because it was it was just passed, you know, this year and the last uh, uh, couple of months. Uh, It'll be very interesting to see how Maine handles that and how um, um, other states can maybe adopt similar regulations. There was somewhere towards the end of the the documentary where one of the commentators said that the only way it stops is when it's, they lose their their subsidies and they have to start paying. And, And I think that's just natural. If you're getting something or you're doing something and there's no extra cost to you, you make it, you sell it, you've made your money and you're done. Uh, it's totally different than being responsible for the entire life cycle of a product. I think that's such an important part, Sharon, and thank you for bringing up Maine's legislation. I wasn't actually aware of that, but it it makes me think of, you know, with Joe saying the wish cycling, like, you know, it, it mentions in the film that if we do these extended responsibility programs that the materials themselves will get easier to recycle because now they have to actually take care of it. And we don't have that. I think Dr. Padgett was one brought up earlier, like the multi-plastic and the different types of um, material that is so hard as a consumer to figure out where to put it. And now, and if you put that onto the actual person who's making the product or the corporation that's making that product, you'll see it become easier to recycle (laughs) in the long run, which I think is great. Um, Something that I wanted to bring up. So I am actually pretty new in my role. So, um, I was going to mention something that I saw in my previous role um, when I was in New York City public school system. And they actually, uh, you know, talking about activists and and student activists are obviously so important in this in this kind of quest uh, for for sustainability. And something that I that I really enjoyed watching was that students and educators got together and really pushed to get styrofoam out of their out of their cafeterias. And, And then they were able to actually get the Department of Education in New York City to ban styrofoam and, you know, they're working on things in in plastic. And so I think, you know, it just goes to show, I think some people think of New York City as this kind of utopia of sustainability. It is not. Um, It has very similar recycling rates as as Nashville um, because it's confusing to recycle. Um, But one of the things that you can do is to get those products out of um, out of our life. And and so that was something that I was really proud to see. And, And I think now because of that work, even Nashville has compostable trays, um, not that they're getting composted right now, but at least they're not styrofoam. Um, yeah. And it's because of, because 
all these cities go together and they buy in together. And so, you know, big cities who make changes can affect other cities. And so it just goes to show that everything that we do kind of ripples out into the larger community. But that was something that I was very, very excited to see. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. And, and I was really proud of um, MNPS to switch to compostables, even though they aren't able to, um, to get those um, processed yet, it's still setting them up for success later. Um, but I will say that, that one of the things that I find very disheartening about um, uh, the documentary and about us here in the United States is how the petrochemical industry and their lobbying groups make you feel responsible for recycling. It's not for you to be responsible for um, creating less waste, which is what we should all be responsible for, reduce our footprint on the planet, but to make you responsible for, you know, only you can put out forest fires has turned into, you can recycle, it's okay. You can get that, it's okay because you can recycle it. And some of the lobbying groups are, are well-known named organizations that have been around for years. And it, it does, I think, make it harder for some people to understand why recycling isn't the answer when we have been sort of trained to think our civic responsibility as Americans is to not litter, recycle, you know, all those things. And it's the same thing, you know, littering and recycling is all a, all a process that has come down because of the petrochemical industry creating all of these single use, not necessarily reusable or sustainable products. And I could rant about this for hours, so I apologize. I think I have a good follow-up with what uh, Christina mentioned as her, uh, as, uh, that the school did. Um, when I was in college at Wayne State in Detroit, as uh, Rachel mentioned, I was with, I led Take Back the Tap, and our goal was to ban, ban specifically single-use plastic water bottles. Such a big problem. It's easier to focus on one specific goal. Um, and uh, yeah, throughout that time, we uh, we were pretty low in numbers. It was just me for like a long time. And then, and then slowly it built up and we we had a, a good group of like six to eight. Um, and our, we, we, we uh, you know, petitioned and get people to sign, you know, and try to hand out reusable bottles. And, and one of the things we always talked about specifically was how like recycling is the last line of defense in the triangle of reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, so we pushed to just reduce, you know, plastic, not, don't buy water bottles, you know, use our refill stations. Uh, we advocated for getting more installed on campus. Um, but that all being said, it is, uh, it is, you know, not our responsibility and it's very, very hard to avoid plastic, but it gets people thinking of the problem and, you know, and how, just how large it is. Uh, but one of the, one of the cool solutions, the cool problem solving moments that we had was working with um, the student center to have a waste free like day where we uh, removed all of the trash cans in the whole student center and replaced them with like uh, waste free stations and we'd have a person next to each of them and we'd have like recycling compost liquid waste and then a tiny little trash <laughs> like bucket and we would teach people like all right compost goes here and then this is here and then we worked with the vendors food vendors to like remove plastic as much as i could and um our diversion rate was up for we did it like three or three or four different events and they were all averaging like above 75 percent, which was really fun um and they're uh, they're still continuing to do those um each each year which is pretty cool uh but yeah, yeah, small baby steps, you know, <laughs> try to try to not look at the whole problem at once. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that it sounds incredibly impressive and especially on a college campus where, you know, it's very easy to have like a throwaway culture, um, which, you know, Dr. Padgett, you're 
20 years now at TSU, like, have you seen any sustainable changes there? Or, you know, have you engaged with your students in your um, environmental justice initiatives to kind of talk about these things? Yeah, well, as I mentioned before, um, in, I think it was, well, I guess it must have been 2003, uh, I read an article by Dr. Um, Paul Mahai called um, African Americans Myths About the Environment, basically dispelling the myth that African Americans didn't care about the environment. Um, but one of the uh, areas where there was a 20% participation gap between uh, African Americans and I guess the majority population was recycling. And so I wondered if that was true here and I think the Kirby program had just kind of gotten off the ground. And so I got the data from Metro and overlaid that with demographic data. Same thing, about a 20% uh, gap. Although on the other end of the scale, some of the lowest, even lower than African-American recycling rates were in the more affluent communities. And I haven't had time to investigate why that is. Um, but so we set out at TSU to create a community university recycling center uh, to educate the community. Um, but then we discovered, well, wait a minute, we're not recycling here. And so, you know, we had to clean our own backyards before we had to go out in the community and start proselytizing about recycling. Um, and so it, it, there was some resistance um, at first because, because of the way that the contracts were set up with the waste um, companies or subcontractors here, recycling was seen as doing something extra on top of taking the regular waste away. But once um, we had a change in administration and also we showed that, um, you know, by taking these solid material, solid waste materials out of the waste stream, it would actually save the university money. And once you say save money to any college, and oh, we're, <laughs> now they're listening. Uh, and so, like I said, Sharon was there and uh, we had a community people that got involved and it took a while a lot of student volunteers uh to finally establish the um drop-off center over here at Tennessee State University and it's um it's it's used a lot and I I, I wish that I had time to do some form of study but I noticed just anecdotally that some of our newer residents, i.e. gentrifiers, seem to be the ones using the recycling center more. But I do see some folks who were originally from the community recycling more also, um, you know, just anecdotally. Um, so, but, you know, so that was a success. It took several years to get it started, um, but we still are recycling here at Tennessee State. The center is still there. And so that, that, that was a big win. And I told my students, I don't think of any, I can't think of any recycling program at a university that was started by the administration. They were all, yeah. students, even the one at MTSU, the, the famous one at MTSU uh, was started by students and faculty, but not the campus administration. So I, I just said, just keep hanging in there. We're, we're going to get this up and going sooner or later. We did. <laughs> I love that, that it's just so encouraging, I think, to hear actual institutional change um, within larger institutions and organizations. Um, because I think the film did talk a lot about an issue of apathy. And, you know, Joe and Dr. Padgett, what you guys have been talking about is how to kind of mobilize that community to start caring. So, I mean, these are great projects that you all had success, success with in the past, but you know, how can those interested now get involved with local efforts regarding waste diversions or environmental stewardship in Nashville? You know, how could, what would you recommend to someone who's kind of saw this film and is like, I need to do something. I need to start acting now. What would you tell them? I think just to jump in, I'm not sure if we were, <laughs> that was directed at all of us or, or to specifically Dr. Padgett and Joe. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, 
I, I think, you know, I don't think it's necessarily trying to get folks to, to care about it. I think a lot of folks already do care about it. I think there's just so many darn competing things on our minds and so many worries that we're already dealing with as humans living in 2021. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's hard to prioritize something that's really confusing. Um, and so I think, I think, there needs to be a lot of research um, and something that our organization is doing is, you know, the environmental justice initiative with TSU and trying to research how do you actually get to specific groups of, of folks and, and meet them where they are and make sure that you understand their needs and their, you know, problems and what's going on in their community and not just saying, you know, this is what you have to do. So I think there needs to be kind of like this individual approach to this very large systematic problem. Um, but really it comes down to your role in the community like what are you what are you good at like there's not really one thing to say hey if you care about this go do this like you might be someone yeah. who really likes to be outdoors and maybe you want to do a litter cleanup or you might be someone who's really artistic and you want to be the one who makes a you know a mural or a, 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 a you know a, a sign at a demonstration um it, it really comes down to what's your passion you know what do you believe in and then how can you slot yourself in to this work because we really need everyone talking about it and we can't have this institutional change that we're all advocating for unless we talk about it with other folks and and and, and push push the dial towards towards action on on a larger scale i think yeah and i would say to remove some of the buffers i know years ago uh i taught an environmental justice course at vanderbilt university not to pick on vanderbilt but it is what it is <laughs> and I mean, I was I was preaching to, to it was like preaching to just this the greatest of sinners. I mean, it, it, it was people just did not believe the students. So uh, just just weren't buying in at all, at all, until uh, we I, I de developed something called the toxic tour of Nashville. And one of the first stops was the uh, old um, thermal facility. And so we're standing there and one of the Vanderbilt students says, is this all the trash for a whole year for Nashville? And the plant operator said, no, this is half of the trash for one day. And there, it was just like, what? And you just in the trucks were just rolling in, rolling in the smell was just, it was just overpowering. And I kept, I told the guy, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> Let him get a good whiff. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of sheltered from, from seeing, you know, our own actions. And we, we went out to the, so the, um, the Bordeaux landfill was still operating back then. And by the, at the end of the class, you know, I had saved some souls. I mean, there were students who said until we went out there and saw the magnitude of the waste that we produce, um, as my, my, my brother Sizzway Herring used to say, or always, he's still around, uh, he says, there's no such place as a way, you know, and we throw stuff away and think, oh, it's gone. Um, but that thermal plant, that was a way. And this is, there is a place where this stuff goes. But if more people not only saw films like, like this, but um, you, you, you have to be up close and, and personal. Um, and one part of the film that I saw was talking about Houston. And I've had a project in Houston for about a year, um, but I, virtually. And I finally got to go to Houston and just see how close those refineries are to people's homes. It's like, it's literally across the street. I mean, the flaring, and you can just look out of the I mean, schoolyards, playgrounds, there's no zoning in Houston. Um, but even for me, I was like, wow, this is shocking. I mean, I was already working on the uh, clean air project there, but, but, but seeing a film is great, but you gotta get people, maybe, to smell it and to, to walk through it and to put their hands in it. And then, you know, that's when you'll get people to say, wow, this is a problem. Yeah, I had a similar experience in, in Detroit seeing that it's called the Detroit Renewable Energy Plant, which is a great name for how awful it is. It was just an incinerator in the middle of a neighborhood, like right in the middle. And it was, it was just, it's, re it's really hard to see stuff like that, you know. But as far as uh, getting involved in Nashville, um, I am the volunteer coordinator at the Cumberland River Compact, and we have a lots of litter cleanups um, that y'all are welcome to join. Our last one of the year is this Saturday at Log Hunter, and I'll put the link 
in the chat you want to sign up but next year we are launching a uh, campy cleanup program well where, where we're going to travel like through the cumberland river basin once a month to different state parks um and and perform cleanups um as you know as, as far east as we can get we also have kayaking cleanups as well those are really fun and then we have normal streamside cleanups where we uh we would just go, you know, down Seven Mile or in Antioch, we do in Mill Creek, but really all over Davidson County and beyond the Cumberland River Basin. So would love to get y'all involved in any of those. Just follow that link that I sent and uh, or email me as well. I can plug in. That's awesome. Thank you, Joe. I think many people will be very excited to know that they can start taking action as soon as this Saturday. Um, doing some litter plex, but of course you can always start, um, like y'all have been saying with reduce, make sure that's your first R all the time. It's reduce, reuse, recycle for a reason. Um, and with that, our chat has been blowing up. Y'all have made some great points. The community is ready to speak. So I'm gonna pass it over to Jen um, and ask her to kind of give the voice back to the crowd. Yes, and the first thing I do want to address is that for those, uh, we've had a few people that have had to jump off, so I just want to address that this absolutely is being recorded, and we are going to post it later this week. It's going to be on our YouTube, um, so we'll make sure if you've registered that you have the link to that so that you can catch any of this, rewatch it as many times as you want as well. Um, we'll also pull some valuable links that were shared in the chat and make sure that that goes out in the follow-up email that we send to everybody as well, but with that, um, I am going to attempt to get through all of these questions while not missing ones that continue to come in. So we've had some really, really good conversation about all of this. Um, I really appreciate everybody being so vocal in the chat, providing resources and links. Um, but we are going to just start back from the beginning, which is one of my favorite questions. Um, is there legislation in Tennessee to ban plastic bags? Um, oh we do my get this God. question a lot. Oh my God. Oh um, my God. And I'm going to add some follow ups. Um, so they started talking about Kroger's zero waste program um, and their campaign, yet they still offer plastic bags. So Kroger, as well as a business, has talked about wanting to go um, bagless. I know they're, uh, um, you know, they're a company that y'all may have some information or not about. Um, personally, but talking a little bit about the legislation to ban plastic bags. Um, and then somebody also followed up with the ban on banning plastic bags. Um, and then, um, yeah, just all of those issues. So if anybody wants to jump in to talk about the ban on banning plastic bags here in the state of Tennessee and the future of potentially being able to ban plastic bags. Well, I that I'm telling you this is one of my favorite <laughs> topics because Nashville had just started a uh, exploring the possibility of maybe possibly having some sort of potential future plastic bag or plastic con container legislation and Memphis also actually they were further ahead than Nashville had been talking about it. And yes, Tennessee, and there are several other Southern states, uh, literally has legislation. Well, th there's two separate pieces of, of, um, of the uh, Tennessee code that I find very interesting. One is that Tennessee, and, and actually a lot of states, has, a, uh, has code that actually requires plastic manufacturers to put the chasing arrows and the number, which tells you what type of plastic it is, on all plastic containers. It's actually required by most states. It's very misleading because not all plastic is even recyclable. But in Tennessee and, and a lot of other states, there is a ban, not just on banning plastic bags, but banning bans on takeout containers and beverage containers and all of that. It's, it is so, um, Kind of concerning when when we go to such an extreme to not to, to not say well we're not ready for it now but let's explore it let's talk about it to saying absolutely no we're banning the ban oh, jan you had to ask that question it was the first question that came in i'm just going in order 
Uh, it is definitely a, a frustrating um, situation, but um, Sharon or anybody, I wasn't sure there's, um, if it's worth talking a little bit about, um, for example, like the farmer's market, I know that there are individual groups that are trying to work around that. Um, so I wasn't sure if, if anybody had some thoughts on, you know, how do we work around this ban on the plastic bag ban or, um, cause folks have been asking a lot about, okay, what, so what do we do now and how can, can we maybe push that in a different direction? Well, one thing that we can do is when you go to a restaurant or you're getting takeout and they give it to you in something sustainable, um, you know, like um, I, I sometimes like going up to East Side Bon Me and getting one of their sandwiches and it just comes in butcher paper and I can eat the sandwich, I can compost the paper. And, uh, you know, as you, as you look at, you know, the type of material that you're getting, when you get takeout or when you're buying stuff and you start buying the things that are more sustainable, that allow you to recycle or compost, you'll start to see, and farmer's market's a good example, the previous farmer's market director um, was dedicated to eliminating styrofoam. And styrofoam is just one of those things I absolutely hate. And um, it's the work of the devil, y'all, I'm sorry. But uh, now all of their containers um, are compostable and and it's not just compostable and then goes into landfill but they work with the compost company which is a a, a local uh, compost uh, processing uh, uh, business to have that uh, the food waste and the compostable containers turned back into you know soil that you can put back on your garden you can actually buy their product at the farmers market, and I believe the Davidson County Farmers Co-op as well. We need to we need to try and support businesses that are doing mm -hmm. their best to do the right thing. I think to bring it back to the larger systematic change, um, we need to subsidize those materials because they are expensive for small businesses to buy compostable plastic. Um, but oil and gas is subsidized, and I'm sure it would be just as expensive if we didn't give them a bunch of money for free to produce it. Um, so we, yeah, as a, as a whole country, we need to subsidize more environmentally friendly um, materials and, and energy. We can go into that, but <laughs> that's a great point, Sharon. Well, I think this, does, oh, Chris. Yeah, wanna... it's, it's, a, it's a little tangential, so maybe it's better for another question, but I'm just thinking about like, conversation that keeps happening is kind of um, using different types of materials and, and prioritizing that. And something that I think is, is interesting is in our, so we have a curriculum for K through 12 um, educators. And one of those, and, and that is actually in part paid for by Kroger sponsorship. Um, and so, you know, they are putting their money where they say, or they're putting their efforts. Um, and one of the things that I love about that curriculum is one of the parts is um, redesign. And so it puts the, it puts the kind of creative juices back onto the student to think, you know, how can we actually redesign these products? How can we make it so we don't need these bags or these plastic bottles? Um, and I think something with plastic is, is it's a cautionary tale of how things can go awry and, and not be exactly how you intended. But it's also, if you make a good product that's useful, it's, it's going to be everywhere. And so it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, it can be exciting if students are, are thinking about not just whether or not it works and if it makes a profit, but if it helps people and planet, it, it can, it can take off. And, and, and we really need people thinking creatively about it. So yeah, you know, are we sad that we have potentially a ban on ban? Yeah. But it, that kind of forces people into thinking creatively. And I think, you know, students are a perfect place to get those new, new ideas. So I think that's, also kind of pertinent. Absolutely. And these, these two last comments kind of feed into some other follow-ups. Um, all of these questions do kind of run together a little bit, but um, you mentioned the Kroger program, and I don't know if anybody knows if they still have their, um, uh, their goal here to go plastic bag free by 2025. I don't know if anybody, that was a question. I wasn't sure if anybody had some thoughts on that. So. But, but then the I next so. step, um, from that, I think is um, the next two questions, just how do we work for, I think people wanna know what can they do to work towards that systemic change, both here in Tennessee, is there anything that folks can actually do to get involved um, 
both here in Tennessee or on the federal level with some of this legislation to, to make a difference, to make a change either through that or then also on the corporation side as well to force corporations to make better choices. Um, so are there any other thoughts around those kind, those two things, how people can get involved to push those things forward? Run for office. <laughs> you can definitely do that. I believe in all of you. <laughs> it's the biggest one I, I would say, and you know, vote also, that's very important. Um, yeah, those are my two. <laughs> oh, I completely agree. We have to tell our elected officials what we think. We have to um, show what we think by what we do and what we what we buy and what we throw away. And I, I think it can be as simple as buying better trash so that you're not buying trash. You're actually buying um, uh, creating less waste. Or it could be, you know, going out, creating a website, starting a campaign, tweeting to your friends. You know, it could be so many different things. But the easiest thing is if everybody just tried to produce less waste, you know, given the situation we're in with just so much supply of disposable single use stuff, just doing our best every day to make better choices. I think that's one of the best things we can do collectively. And I must quote one person from the documentary, it was towards the very end, and he said, and I quote, the challenge is not with plastics themselves, it's what happens after people use them. We are basically the blame, according to the petrochemical industry for plastic. So let's be the solution by turning it back around on them and reducing, trying not to get that stuff and talking to our elected officials, lobbying, whatever it is that takes, banding together, you know, sitting in on panel discussions like this and just educating ourselves so that when we can, we make, we make better choices. Absolutely. Um, so I'm gonna switch this now. Uh, this is still kind of on the same topic. There's a lot around just legislation. Um, so folks are talking, uh, started to move into the bottle bill. Um, so why not put a deposit on every plastic bottle? Um, oh wait, there's many questions. Let me scoot back. Um, I would like to know how we can still advocate for a plastic bag ban. We already kind of talked about this and hold corporations responsible for the packaging they use. We talked about that. How can we implement the bottle bill in Tennessee? So that's a, a slightly separate topic. Um, what is everyone's thoughts on a bottle bill here in the state? Um, yes, and then people kind of got into talking about some of those questions about um, those centers and taking them back and getting money for them. And some folks had some experience with bottle bills in other states. Um, but does anybody have any thoughts about how bottle bills could potentially, a bottle bill could potentially work in the state um, in answering some of those questions around that type of legislation? Well, we've had bottle bills come up multiple times over the over the years many 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 times and um they usually don't succeed because you know there's businesses lobbying against it well they have never succeeded to date because of business lobbying against businesses lobbying against it and um you know in tennessee and i'm i'm gonna tell you i get some of this money too for litter pickup but the beverage industry in tennessee gives money to TDOT that then passes out to every county to pick up litter. I love getting that money. In Nashville, the, the sheriff's office actually gets the grant from TDOT and um, uh, Metro Beautification gets the education money. So we do social media, we do um, volunteer litter cleanup, stuff like that. But it's hard for you know individuals to fight against the beverage industry and all their money. So, uh, and now there is a, a new uh, group called Tennessee Clean that has started another um, sort of round with the state on a bottle bill. I think it's worth looking at and seeing if you agree with, with their approach. But uh, I do wanna say bottle bills are right up there with recycling. It's, they, are, they don't, it's not a panacea. It's just another way of trying to get 
material out of the waste stream. We still have to make better choices about what we get. And we shouldn't use a bottle bill as a reason to sort of justify, oh, well, we have a bottle bill, so I'll get money back and it will get recycled. You know, we could, we, we have all of this, this plastic piling up and the bottle bill is not going to get it all recycled, unfortunately. They do help reduce litter. They do help increase recycling. But I think that collectively, we need to look at something that, that, that is higher, that is focusing more on not getting it in the first place instead of just like, what do we do now that we have it? I think also, you know, I'm always wary of anything that kind of puts a price on the waste because then it needs, you kind of continue to need that waste to get that revenue or get that, you know, money kind of like with incineration, waste to energy, like people can make that argument, but if, if you're just constantly trying to get more waste to create that energy or to get that deposit, then it's, it's moot. You're still, you're still creating more and more waste and you're not exactly, you're not, you're not solving the actual problem. Um, that's a really excellent point to think about it that way. Um, all right, let's pull up another question here. Sharon, this might be another one to you. Um, there's big confusion. What kind of plastic can be recycled? The rules change from year to year. Example, plastic number one is recyclable, but clamshells, which are number one plastic cannot. Why? Um, I am going to throw out there that I did share a link in the chat that goes to one of our previous um, Urban Green Lab and Zero Waste Nashville Sustainable in the City episodes that um, talk all about plastic bottles here in Nashville and why we don't accept them. So I do encourage you to watch that um, as well if you really want an in-depth response to this. But um, if anyone wants to shoot out just kind of a little bit of information as to why we accept some kinds of plastics and not others. So in Nashville, and this happened um, a, about two years ago, we made a strategic decision um, to only tell you as Nashville residents to put in your recycling containers, the stuff that we know is getting recycled. And we had a lot of pushback because if people are like, well, why don't you recycle clamshells, for example? Well, we, we can't recycle, you know, we pick it up, we take it to the industry. And if there's markets, if there are people that can use it, that's when it gets recycled. And the problem you have with things like clamshells, even though they're number one plastic and a plastic bottle, which is also number one plastic, is they're made differently. They have different additives. One is, is actually more flexible than the other and can, um, can be picked up in an optical sorter to get it going the right direction. Just because it is the same, you know, polyethylene, it's made differently and you can't necessarily recycle it the same way. The industry, there's just not a huge demand for clamshell containers. Nobody's really making other products out of it. There are a few recyclers out there, mostly out on the West Coast that are doing stuff. But what we have to focus on is not you know, how can I recycle this thing, but how can I get stuff that's going to recreate less waste and the stuff that, that I have to get that will create some kind of waste is going to be recyclable. You know, it's unfortunate. It's hard to go to the store and not get stuff in plastic, but we have to look for ways and make strategic decisions. That doesn't mean you don't get clamshell containers. Maybe that's the only way you can get, you know, my birthday cake. I don't know. <laughs> But, you know, a general rule, you always try to make those decisions to create less waste and understand that just like any industry, nobody's going to buy, you know, scrap plastic if they can't make something else out of it. And so don't misinterpret, you know, all those recycling symbols on things as, oh, well, we should be able to recycle. No, the industry should only be using plastic that is highly recyclable and they're not. I know we are at time. I don't, I want to throw out this one last question though. So if y'all can bear with us, um, I am curious about the effect of microplastics on public health. This is a topic we hadn't um, gotten into in our questions or follow-up Q and A. So the T uh, Tennessee river was recently found to have an extraordinarily high level of microplastics. How are these affecting things like cancer rates? 
So Joe, I wasn't sure if that might be a, a question for you to talk a little bit about microplastics. Um, I don't think we know the effects on the body of microplastics yet because it's such a new issue, but we do consume a lot of it through drinking water. There's places in, um, oh, I can't remember the name. It's a, it's a remote place that has microplastics in the air um, and in the east, I just blanked on it. Um, yeah, and I think I think it said that we consume a credit cards worth of plastic every week or so, which is terrifying. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just goes back to just avoid, avoid, avoid as much as you can, reduce, refuse, <laughs> and then recycle. Um, but I, yeah, as far as I know, I don't think I don't think there's any research done just yet on how exactly those can affect us but as it, um you know plastic does have cancer causing attributes to it especially um water bottles if they they found um chemicals cancer causing carcinogens in plastic water bottles after they've been left out in the sun like for a certain amount of time unopened um and then tested them and they found carcinogens in them so i don't think it's healthy <laughs> is my <laughs> final thought probably not great yeah and i'm sure there's going to be a lot more studies coming out um with more concrete information about those impacts um as we move into the future um i appreciate you y'all sticking with us for one more minute rachel i'm going to turn it over to you to close us out i know we didn't get to all of your questions there was a very big debate about aluminum versus plastic that we didn't get to go over um but this has been excellent discussion and rachel i'll turn it back to you yeah so sorry we're a little bit over time but thank you all so much for joining us both our panelists our wonderful community in our chat here sharing links back and forth um it is America Recycles Day. Make sure you are recycling right here in Nashville. Um, it should not be your first step, reduce, reuse, um, but make sure when you are getting that recycle stage, you're doing it correctly. Um, so feel free to visit recycle.nashville.gov um, to look at our waste wizard here on our Nashville Waste and Recycling app if you have any questions on how to properly recycle here in Nashville. Um, and again, your link is good for the rest of the month. I hope you share it. I hope you feel empowered to make a difference. Um, like Joe said, you can get involved this weekend um, with Cumberland River Compact. And thank you all so, so much for joining. All right, Thanks have a good one, everyone. Bye.